Despite the all-white grounds across the Northland, gardeners are thinking green and preparing for a whole new season. We'll talk about winter's impact and predictions for this growing season, have new trends in plants and flowers, and introduce some new garden experts who are here to take your questions on this spring special edition of Great Gardening Straight Ahead. It really is a special environment. I love the organization of the petals. It's a campanula, campanula conglomerata. Hummingbirds will go there, the bees are all over the place. Urban gardening is a wonderful thing. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening, I'm Pamela Fish. Over the next 90 minutes, we hope to inspire you with beautiful blooms and lush edibles you might want to try in your landscape this spring. And we'll have advice from resident expert, educator and horticulturist, Bob Olin. Thanks for being with us, Bob, along with both. Jane Anklum, who is here from the University of Wisconsin Extension. Mm -hmm. Jane, thanks for being with us. Thanks Welcome, Jane. Me. Nice to have yeah. someone representing the UW system yeah. from Very across good. the bay. Yeah. yeah. Happy well, to be here. I want to let our viewers know that Jane is one of three guest experts joining us today in lieu of Tom Casper, who's pursuing other enterprises and won't be with us on Great Gardening this season. He will be missed. Now, we also want to tell you our phone volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners are here to answer the phones when you call in those garden questions that you've been hanging on to all winter. You can call 218-788-2844, or we have that toll-free number, 877-307-8762, or you can even email your questions to askgardening at wdse.org. And if you'd like to make a pledge of support to this public television station, they can help you with that too. This is our annual member drive and we're gifting the annual garden bus tours to those who donate. Our summer tour of Twin Ports Gardens in July always sells out and this year we're adding a second coach bus so hopefully all who choose to can come along. It's, uh, Bob, as you know, you've been with us on it. It's, uh, it's great. We have some amazing gardens across the Northland, and we get to walk the grounds and visit with the gardeners. It's always amazing a lot garden. of fun. Amazing gardens. We always have spectacular weather, so Pam takes care of everything. <laughs> yeah, right, right, even the weather. <laughs> Not today, though, did no. I? <laughs> <laughs> weather. All right. Um, Jane, tell us about some of the gardens that you care for. Well, you know, over in Douglas County, we, we're challenged with the clay and we've got the sand in the southern part of the county, so we have a lot of variety. And a lot of the gardens that we're working on this year are going to be more and more community gardens, um, trying to get um, more of those opportunities for people to, to grow together, health, health fresh vegetables. Fresh vegetables, mm -hmm. yep. People are want, wanting to grow their own food, so mm -hmm. good. We're glad to hear that. Well, right now we want to um, take a look back at the winter weather, which of course isn't over yet, but <laughs> we're going to talk about it a little and its potential impacts. And um, Bob, here's just a look at, at what we were seeing in the fall, first of all. Yeah, just a quick little rundown. We want to do a comparison between this year and the previous year. Everyone's very concerned because we had so much winter damage last year. I mean, right. it was winter browning and just about everything, even our native species, but remember, during the fall of 17, we had a very warm October. And then we came in and we had snow, but it melted off, and then we got sharply cold temperatures, so nothing really had an opportunity to acclimate. This year's fall was totally different. Very uh, cold in October. October was cold. If people mm -hmm. even remember Halloween, it mm -hmm. was just very, very cold. So everything had kind of cooled down, acclimated, and then we hit some snow, which we really never melted off. So we had, mm -hmm. a, we had a couple inches of snow, and then it hasn't stopped snowing since. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's the trouble. And so, so should, we, how, how, should we be concerned about the impact that's going to have? I, I, either of you can answer that. Well, it's going to have some impact one way or another. And yeah. I think there's the good and the bad, the yin and the yang. The good is that uh, a lot of our tender perennial materials really going to be well protected. It's insulation. Good Wonderful. insulation. Uh, the other side, of course, is the snow load on some of our plants and um, and how much can they take and if when it melts, does the ice form on top of them? Will they be breaking? Um, and then what kind of heating might happen in, in underground when, this, when it starts melting? That's right, the melt will be important. So one of the, perhaps one of the drawbacks is we're gonna have some protection for some of the nastier insect pests mm -hmm. that are down in the ground. Sure. I think of the uh, pupae of Colorado potato bleedle, 
Maybe our spotted winged Wasafa, they're all down there pretty comfortable right, right now. Right, so yeah, yeah, they're not, they're that's not the downside sweating of all this that out. Snow yeah. <laughs> we have some more pictures of some of, some of the damage that, uh, that maybe ensued in uh, sunscald. These are just taken, so this, that's previous sunscald damage, but people should be aware that with all of that snow out there coming into March with this bright sun, we're gonna hold onto that snow for a long time and there can be considerable damage that occurs to all thin bark trees. This is apple, but it can be any, any tree that hasn't had the opportunity to develop much of a thick outer bark. And this is one thing I've seen countless times where on the south side we've got sun scald damage and that destroys the vascular tissue so the roots actually die on that side of the tree. So we get a leaner that occurs. The roots are aggressive on the other side. So we would have to try to repair something like that. We may see some of that now here, these were protected. If you can see right at the snow line, we had a four foot column there. We were protecting that bark from both sun scald as well as from rodent damage, but the snow has come right up to that level at this particular point. So that upper portion of the tree, this ha happens to be apple, you might want to protect from sun scald again with maybe a white latex paint on a day when the temperature is above mm -hmm. freezing. Mm -hmm. Now here, uh, you could see Jane. Didn't get the protection. I looked at that. <laughs> we, that one is in my slide, but I no. think that fence went on after the damage. <laughs> <laughs> That's from Ted Pillman in Superior. Yeah, he put a fence up, but it hey, was Ted. too late. The rabbits got at it. Yeah, the and, horses uh, his, out of the barn. His grapevine as well was damaged. Now, is is that gonna is that grapevine gonna come back? Do you think? Oh. Well, you know, a lot of them could stand a good pruning, so sure. maybe they've done <laughs> us a favor in that in that regard. But mm -hmm. uh, anytime you get. Uh, damage like that to the outer bark where a lot of that vascular tissue has been damaged. Uh, you know, it's going to take a while. It doesn't kill a plant, but it definitely maims it and sets it back quite a well, bit. Certainly on these, the girdling isn't obvious either, so there's a fighting chance to, to get these, through. These may yeah. make it, yeah. But Those uh, could make it, okay. Obviously, and the deer are having a tough winter. You may think you've had a tough winter moving the snow, but you can imagine our, our native whitetail population that's out there and the winter severity index is pretty high. Keep the fences up because they are going to be browsing heavily on anything that isn't, uh, isn't protected. All right. Um, is that the last of our slides? Oh, no, we wanted to talk about emerald ash borer. We've been hearing a lot from people that they think that this weather may have gotten rid of some of it. What do you guys think? Well, you know, um, the, the emerald ash borer does overwinter in the bark of the tree, so um, there's a good chance that some of them are going to be knocked back. However, um, they breed quickly. They can, their numbers will keep coming up, so it kind of remains to be seen what we're going to... And they move slowly from tree to tree. We may not notice it just as much this year. What right. do you think about that, Bob? Yeah, I think there's a lot of talk, you know, and there's been some research. Once we get down below 20 below, we cut back on the population mm -hmm. significantly. If we get down to 30 below, now in your area, we certainly had areas of 30, 40, 50 below. Mm -hmm. That's pretty devastating to Emerald Ash Borer. It'll probably take out 95 to mm -hmm. nearly 100%. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. problem is we've got all this snow, so there's, uh, again, they're protected. They might be protected under the protected snow line. Protected again, so I think okay. we have to be conscious keep, and keep remember mm -hmm. never to move ash firewood. Uh, yep. We want that stationary because they don't move on their own. They've been right. transported, so okay. we want to be mm -hmm. careful about all that. All right. We're going to take a look uh, at some video that was taken today from photographer A.J. Larson. Uh, this is our signs of the season, and guess what? As you might expect, it's mostly white, but the, there is some green. It's, it's evergreen. <laughs> That's about all we can hope for at this point. And nice March. How far are we from spring now? <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite, quite a ways. Um, so we've got some questions, so uh, let's go ahead and, and take a look at those. Um, Michelle from Duluth is wondering about some double daffodil she kept in the refrigerator October to February and um, experienced bud blast. How do you prevent this? As she, she's got them from the bulbs, she dug them and brought them in? Yep, she kept them over and brought them in the refrigerator. Hmm. And well, every one of them experienced bud blast. Well, now, I don't know what that is. The, 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 bud, the buds are going to break for her, right, you know. Right. And uh, she probably had hoped that she could hold them there. And then mm -hmm. when she brought them out in the warmer temperatures. But that's a long period of time to hold a plant like that with the oh, buds that already formed right, from yeah. October all the way here into March. So I think... Maybe she was going to force them and she forgot. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I When think would you take them out to, if you were going to force them? Uh, do you guys... Earlier. Well, yeah, forcing is usually when we're talking about the bulbs that didn't get planted. Right. So we're going we're gonna to let them in under cooler conditions for about 60 days or so. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, they're going to sprout. But it sounds like she might have brought those in. Oh, 
Oh. Because she already had the buds there. If not, if she'd actually forced them and has left them in the refrigerator, and she's getting this bud blast just because of that prolonged period of time they've been in there. Okay. All right. So I'd take them out and enjoy yeah, them. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Let, let, <laughs> let the buds blast. Yeah, go, yeah. <laughs> All right. The timing was off. Um, Carol from Sawyer County says, what makes a seed an heirloom? Hmm. Well, some of the, you know, some of the um, genetics that we have now are a result of what's been from the past and been bred um, over many years by breeders to come up with certain characteristics. And so if you can go back and find the seed that was the original parent of that, um, that there's a, certainly a lot of talk about that. And we are looking for some of those um, those o older plant materials that are that we can rediscover and kind of recolonize, clean them back to their original, um, their original characteristics. So, yeah. Here's a question I've never seen before, and I don't, I don't know if any of us have the answer, but someone's wondering what heirloom bean was used as part of the Three Sisters. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> there, that might take some research. I think there is an answer. Do you know? Yeah. And I, I can't you know say what there, there it is. You know, there, there are these runner beans or pole yeah. beans, of course, because okay. that's part of the, uh, part of the three, uh, but it's one of the original, and it might have been uh, one of the Blue Lake varieties. Uh, it, could, it, it could have been, and it, you know, it wouldn't have been here, it would have been on the trade route up from so the south. Well, and maybe we should explain that a Three Sisters garden is made up of corn, beans, and squash, correct? Corn, beans, and squash, mm -hmm. and the corn supports is the support of the mm -hmm. trellis for the beans that wrap up and, and the squash. And any, have you tried it? I've uh, yes, <laughs> and it, it's a wonderful, it's pretty, and it's, it's fun, pretty. It's, it, it tells a story. And it kind of works, but it yeah. doesn't feed the family. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> many, many, many of them. Yeah. Mm, okay, um, a question about beets. Are beets and chard related? You know, they're not, oh, which is interesting. Okay. Even though the stems are they're in different, uh, different genus, and they're they're a little bit different. And obviously, the Swiss chard, uh, you know, we're harvesting the leafy tissue where the beets. We're harvesting both of the beets as well as the uh, the root tissue mm -hmm. as well there. Okay. Uh, we'll take one more before we move on. Kathy from International Falls has a maple tree and an apple tree. They didn't drop their leaves. Why, why is that? Well, again, it, it's related to the temperatures and the, and the onset of temperatures this fall, which is a little bit different. We've seen right. a fair amount of that for whatever mm -hmm. reason. We came in cold and then everything kind of sat and it stopped. And they you know. could hold their leaves, right? They weren't being kicked off. and. Mm -hmm. They will be pushed out as In soon the as the buds <laughs> begin to form. Yeah, so okay. she doesn't so have not, not to worry about, about that. Then. Not mm -mm. to worry about okay. that. Okay, no. great. Well, we uh, love to see pictures sent in by viewers of the lush, gorgeous plant life grown here. These spring flowers raised last year in Duluth are one fine example. Wendy Showbloom of Duluth loves her work. And who wouldn't when these are the results? The white daffodils grow at the home of a client whose garden she helps care for, as do these early blooming blue and white scylla. Other spring blooms include wild violets, purple primrose, and the blossoms of flowering almonds. Then come the graceful dangling blooms of the red bleeding heart, the plum tones of the pulmonaria, the nodding blossoms of the deep burgundy hellebores, the complex composition of this purple iris, and more irises in a darker shade of purple. Groupings of the deep colored iris stand out beneath this azalea with the contrasting chartreuse foliage of an adjacent spirea. Please share your photos of blossoms and blooms from across the Northland. Send pictures all this season to Great Gardening at WDSE.org. So again, keep sharing those pictures of your favorites from last season for our Grow and Show segment, and we'll get them on the air to share with other gardeners. Okay, we're going to come back to a couple more questions, you guys. Uh, Terry from Hermantown says, um, if I can eat vegetables from a garden center, why can't I eat the flowers from the same garden center if they're treated the same? I guess I'm not sure where he's going with that, but um, only certain flowers are edible, They're, correct? Yeah, to maybe begin that's with. what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah, and we have to be a little careful. We get a few mm -hmm. shots later. Some of the flowers can be very poisonous, right. as a matter of fact. But, uh, you know, my, my thought or concern, and we don't know what 
garden center he was referring to right. that was producing both the edibles, uh, if he's growing something out, in a production sense, unless they're organic, they may be using some kind of uh, synthetic pesticide for control there, which, where you wouldn't want to eat anything, and you'd be, you'd be eating the vegetable after it had grown uh, out. Yes. You know, through the season where there isn't any problem with residue, but uh, if there were some flowers there in that production setting, you'd have to be uh, concerned. First, are they edible? Mm -hmm. And then how are they grown and how are they raised? So you, asking those kinds of questions, I think, is what's, what's important. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another question about beets. Um, somebody wants to know the history of the beets, which wow. I don't know if you guys can <laughs> answer, but, but mm. we can talk about their nutritional value. Beets are kind of unique, you know, and actually I think they're getting a lot of attention. They are very popular. Yes. And there is a producer down in Texas that's got something called the Super Beet Formula. Really? And he's marketing it all over the country. <laughs> I've heard ads so and seen ads. Maybe that's what's going on. So maybe on. that's what's being generated. <laughs> but beets are great. Uh, they're a cool season crop. Right. They contain a very unique antioxidant, different than the tomatoes, different than the blueberries, something called betalin, which is very, very unique and very nutritious as well as the fact that they're, they're sweet and, and really right. enjoyable. So, and lots of variety, have you noticed right? all the different you can, colors? The colors, they're beautiful to cook, you can cook so many different ways, and the, the tops are edible, and the bottom, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great crop. It is, and, and, we and it grow grows it. good up here. <laughs> that's right, we grow it so you guys have both grown beets. Yeah. Lots and lots yeah. and yeah. lots of them. Yeah, and my yep. mom always loved growing them because you could eat the greens first, and uh, then, yeah, and you yeah. still have a beautiful. They're multi-purpose. Mm -hmm. Some uh -huh. people are a little reluctant, or they're not beet eaters, but you know we've got those golden beets, bald oh, door, right. and they're delicious. You gotta start them there, and also some of the albino beets, one called avalanche, it's wonderfully uh -huh. sweet. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, someone in your family that doesn't like beets, start them on either the goldens or the white beets. They're delicious. Okay. We're going we're gonna to go to Hayward for a tour, but I, I need to say thank you to Jane before oh. we do because it's been so great to have you here very much. and really Thanks. appreciate your time and, yeah. and your expertise, and, and we hope that uh, we get you back here okay. during this se regular season of, of great gardening. We will have another local expert coming in in our next segment, but as we said, right now we want to take you on a tour to Hayward, Wisconsin, where a couple has devoted much of their lives to growing native and exotic plants that fill their expanse of tame woodlands. Welcome to our garden in Hayward up on the Kettle Moraine. My wife Louise and I have been gardening here since 1977. My favorite challenge is to grow plants that grew here in northern Wisconsin before the Ice Age. Frontier, that's what I call the heath bed, and it's a test bed for plants that like dry, sandy conditions. So what we have is sheep laurel, uh, which is listed as zone two. It's an evergreen, it's in bloom right now. Sheep laurel here have, uh, have suckered. There's also winged broom down below with the, with the uh, flat leaves, actually they're flat stems, and it's just starting to bloom with the yellow flowers. The sand myrtles, it's just finishing up in bloom. It's this white froth here with the white flowers, little foamy flowers on it. These are all gorgeous evergreens that like just dry sand, and they do extremely well in our area here. With age, it gets this gnarly form, it's real picturesque. It's a type of a Dutchman's pipe. It has the coolest little flowers. The close up, they look like little jack in the pulpits. It's just exciting to see, uh, see plants that people grow here and see where they grow in the wild. I like traveling around and collecting cuttings of plants. I always make sure that, that there's a large colony of the plant. So, so number one is conservation. This is a mountain laurel called Sarah. Again, it's one that likely grew here before the Ice Age and it's thriving here. Well, people don't realize they can grow mountain laurel here. Mountain laurel is just perfectly happy if you get there from the right source. This is a Dawn Redwood right here. It's leafing out a little late. This was a cutting that I collected, oh, maybe 10 years ago. They have the potential to, to get close to the house, maybe too close. I might have to move the corner of the house. <laughs> I'm not gonna cut it down. Welcome back, our resident garden expert, Bob Olin, still with us, and we've invited a, another local grower to join us and share his expertise. He is Janaki Fisher Merritt of the Food Farm in Rental. Thanks for being with us. We yeah, really happy to be appreciate here. it. Yeah. Now, um, we know that you've been growing food on the farm in Rental for a while now. Yep. Is it is it just edibles that you grow there? Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much mm -hmm. just the edibles. My wife has a 
flower garden out yeah. in front of the house. So, okay. But other than that, our, our main focus is the vegetables. Yep. Sure, sure. Enough to okay. keep you busy too, isn't it? Oh yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and we know you've got the dirt on some good dirt. We're gonna talk more about that a little bit yeah. later. Um, we'll have viewer questions coming your way very soon as well. But, but first we wanna take a look at some of the edibles that are expected to be hot items this season. Yeah, there, there are a number of them that we Do would expect to be okay. hot this year, yeah. and we've got a listing of them. And, uh, but uh, from your perspective, what are you seeing, uh, Janaki? I mean, the public wants more and more edibles. That's my experience. I think there's some concern about food safety, obviously, yep. and better nutrition, mm -hmm. buying local, buying from the grower that you know so you know the quality of your yep. food. I think those trends are all firmly in place. But yep. Are there any particular vegetables that are jumping out and... Uh, you think are going to be featured this year? Well, I hear people are really into these like little tiny pepper yeah, things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't do a lot of that stuff. The way I look at it is we provide just a, a good diversity of staple crops. Right. And then as a CSA, we think it's really great for people at home to try out fun little things that they like to grow rather than feeling like they have to grow everything. Sure. Grow a few things that you really like at home and do a good job with it mm -hmm. and then get your staples from us. That's what we like to do. Then you got to start with something that really grows well, because believe it or not, yes. peppers are a warm season crop. They sure and are. And this winter's demonstrated, we have a cold climate. <laughs> <laughs> but there peppers a, are a big item. Yeah, and there is a pepper that's uh, in our segment here. I think we're gonna, yes. we can go to the videotape now. There we go. With the variety widening, as people prioritize fresh flavors in their cooking. The new Amazel basil, an Italian sweet basil, is said to be one of the first that's resistant to downy mildew. Patio pots for vegetables provide more convenience, and there are more and more vegetables to try, like the multicolored confetti peppers, the Tom Thumb pea, or maybe some bumblebee tomatoes or small cucumbers in a pot. Deep pigments mean more nutrients in your diet, so opt for an islander pepper, red onion, purple cauliflower, or purple kohlrabi. And colored potatoes continue to be a popular choice as well. All right, well, again, there are a few of the vegetables and uh, so many more that yeah, and, people are going to be interested in. As those slides demonstrated, people really are nutrition conscious, yeah. and, and we're seeing color in everything. I noticed yeah. the uh, the bumblebee, some of the specialty tomatoes, and then we had that big, yeah. beautiful graffiti uh, purple yeah. cauliflower. Mm -hmm. Purple carrots. Purple pur carrots. Purple, carrots purple potatoes. Well. Yeah. 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 And they were just at one time kind of a novelty special. Now we're really beginning to see more and more of them, and people are showing a real interest. The yeah. catalogs are filled with them. Yeah. Too. Yeah. All right, let's get to some questions, you guys. Um, Judy from Bovee says, after cyclamens stop blooming and lose their leaves, can I do anything to have them bloom again? No, I, not realistically. Okay. I'm not in that season. I don't think that she's gonna be successful getting a second bloom out of those. Okay. So just uh, have to wait till next year. Yeah. Uh, buy another one. Yeah, <laughs> too. I do like those cyclamens though. They're fun to have in the yeah. winter. Um, inside, of course. <laughs> um, Linda from Duluth says, I have a grapevine that's six years old that never produces grapes. Now, if either of you have, have grown grapes, have you come across this issue? Well, you know, the big, the big thing on grapes is you got to start, we've just got a few, a handful that are really well suited for this, yeah. uh, for this area. And they all go back to the original uh, river grape. And Beta is one that's been around for a long, mm -hmm. long time. And if she's not getting any production, you know, they like full sunlight, good drainage, good growth. And then uh, going back to some of the original varieties that are good and winter hardy for this, uh, for this area. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where we got ours. We have, it's growing up a maple tree. It doesn't have good sun. It's it, on pretty good ground. And but, it's producing oh, it produces crazy? like crazy. Sure, sure. Really? Uh, no, I would, yeah, just get a cutting of something that's good. They grow real fast. Yeah, they, yeah. So. they will, yes. All right. Uh, we did touch on this earlier, but Dan from Duluth wants to know, with this winter's cold temperatures, am I likely to lose some of my perennials? I don't think there's much risk. I think the perennials are going to do real well because we cooled down and then we put a boatload of snow on top of them. So I think they're going to do very, very well. Perennial damage, I think, will be very, very minimal this year. My take. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And then Susan has uh, something similar about, she says, with the deep snow on my perennial beds, how do I know when I can start planting? 
<laughs> when the snow's gone? <laughs> when things melt away oh, a little bit, yeah. I think. <laughs> I mean, it's about how the heat of the soil, or what? What do you? How do you determine? Well, soils are cool. They were coming in, and they're going to stay. They're going to stay cool. So first off, uh, you know, I would wouldn't be surprised if we had a re relatively rapid melt because we got two things. We got a season moving along, and then we got the calendar. You'd be surprised how we kind of catch up. And you know, by the time that snow's melted. Uh, and we let a little bit of the water drain off. Uh, she certainly can be planting any any perennials. We want to get those in as soon as the snow is gone. And there may not be a lot of frost there either because of this heavy snow blanket. And, so. and transplants should do fine, you know, as long as your ground is is thawed out and not waterlogged. Right. They should be fine as far as seeds go. You know, you got to follow the. You know, use a use a thermometer and just see what your soil temps are to make sure that it's the right temperature for those seeds to germinate. Sure. And just a rule of thumb, uh, cool season crops, obviously you can tolerate the cool season, yep. and the seed will actually germinate. Warm season, we have to be careful with. Everything yep. from squash to beans on out, because particularly if you're using organic, untreated seed, sure. there you do have to be sure that that yep. soil's warmer, so you're looking at the end of May rather than the end of April. Yep. <laughs> and this follows uh, what we're talking about. Diane in Hermantown wants to know when I can start planting my tomato seeds, and what's uh, the best potting mix? Couple of good questions. <laughs> What's your schedule? And I'll share mine. Probably the same, similar. Yes. So for our outside tomatoes, it's sometime mid-April, early to mid-April, and we're we're looking to get a really nice big plant to set out. But we're giving up plenty of soil. It, it's not just the kind of soil you're using for potting soil. You want to make sure it's got plenty of room to grow, and not get root bound and all and leggy. Make sure it gets plenty of sunlight too. Because if they're reaching for the light and you stick them outside, they're just gonna, it's not a happy transition. So, you know, those things are really important, but you know, sometime in mid-April, if you're really antsy, seed's pretty cheap, mm -hmm. start some right now, and then just throw them in the compost <laughs> in mid-April and start new sure. ones on time. We like compost, it, don't Yeah, we? right. <laughs> it's, it's, Even if you have to make the plants that go into it. Right, you're way better <laughs> off doing that than starting them now just because you're itching to get in the dirt and then expecting them to be in good shape come June. Sure. And sure. for so many folks that don't have access to a greenhouse, really it's about light. And yes. if you have artificial light and willing to transplant, then you can yep. start a little earlier. But if or, it's one transplant out of your seed flat, then you're looking at middle yep. April. Otherwise, maybe early April would be fine too. People yeah. get a little okay. jump that way. Yep. Great. Well, we visited the food farm last year and talked not only vegetables, but what's needed to make them grow. Here's a look. We spent a lot of time and effort building the soil on this place from old hay ground that didn't have a lot of life in it to really rich soil that can really produce consistently and that's resilient to all the crazy weather that we've been having more and more often. So, you know, as much attention as you can put into increasing organic matter, reducing tillage that's unnecessary, really fostering the soil life that really makes your soil come alive and, and feeds plants. Instead of just using the soil as something to hold the plant up and you're dumping X amount of nitrogen on to feed it, you know, plants that access their nutrients through a biological system rather than a chemical system are much healthier and resilient. And so that's, that's a key thing to, to focus on. Doesn't mean that the chemistry doesn't matter, but really focusing on the, the biology of it really makes a difference. So John, a key care of the soil is a big part of the work and the preparation. And Bob, I know that you've always talked about getting a soil test for gardeners. Uh, it's it's an important thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's take a look at what what makes a good bed. Uh, here are some of the things we want to look for in the garden soil. Yeah, these are pretty basic. And John, Hickey, you can uh, sure. jump in any time, but we want something that's well drained. Now we're getting a lot of these rainfall events, and I think drainage is even more important yes, than it has been much. in the past. So you can raise the bed and you can modify your soils. So if you have heavy clays you're dealing with, so it's kind of a, you know, a contrast. You want it well drained, but you want it to be able to hold some moisture as well when yep. we get dry mid season. So that's where your organics come in. If yep. you can organic build organic matter is huge there because it benefits you both ways. Big part of it. And you want to keep it pathogen free if you can. The soil borne disease can be really difficult to, to manage. And then we have to have something that supplies there are 13 essential plant nutrients, so we got to get all of them. Can you name them all? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
You I, know, I know you could, but we don't, have, have, we don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you're going to plant in containers, here's a look at some a well, something that you might use, but you, you might have to modify modified. this. Modified. Janicki, you know, if, a lot of folks in our listing area have mm -hmm. got heavy clays to deal with. They mm -hmm. don't have lighter soils. Sure. So many of them, the best option might be to grow in containers or in a raised bed with an actual potting soil. Especially for those warm season crops, like you say, with tomatoes, where you could, if you had those in a large container, you can put them out on the deck during the day right. and then pull them in at night if you want to get a little jump on the season. So we'll, t we'll take a look at the mix that you use. You can buy commercial mix, you can make your own. Mm -hmm. It's all based on peat, not peat moss, but the actual peat that's, that's uh, mm -hmm. horticultural peat that's harvested. And then we got to break that down a little bit. Doesn't have any nutrition, you got to be aware of that. And yet the, you add vermiculite, you add perlite for moisture holding capacity, and then maybe just a cut of the slide said black dirt, but we're looking for uh, mineral soil, which in northeastern Minnesota, northwestern Wisconsin, is actually going to be brownish in color. You don't want to add the black stuff that comes from the bottom of the peat bog. Good black soils are from southern Minnesota, southern Wisconsin, yeah. where you really have a mineral soil that's got about 30% organic in it. You know? Sure. Well, and the other thing that people often refer to as black dirt is cow manure or horse manure that's been sitting in a mm. pile for five or ten years and you just have to you have to know the source because oftentimes that can be stuff that's been sitting under four foot tall weeds and when you put that on the on your garden that's what you're gonna get sure. so you know a little bit of weed source composted there. cow manure is great but as long as you, you it's taken care of first so you don't have mm -hmm. you're not importing a whole bunch of weeds so we have so many um, potting soils on the market most of those are fine you know, I, I view them as kind of a starting point. Okay. And um, mm -hmm. you have to be very conscious because you're basically peat. You have to be conscious of your trace nutrients because there are 13 nutrients, mm -hmm. and a lot of people come over the top. And uh, we'll use uh, we'll use a name brand here if we may, but people are familiar with the Miracle Grow right. type of product, a water soluble mm -hmm. product, mm -hmm. and that's largely N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But we've got to get everything else. Yeah. Your, your soils, your native soils, uh, have all those trace nutrients taken sure. care of, but in a potting soil, we have to be conscious of that and either get a, a water soluble that is, uh, contains those, so spin the package around, look what's in there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or actually using uh, some compost or even some yep. of the well-rotted manure so you carry in some of those trace nutrients yes. as well. So we, we mix all of our own potting soil, except for uh, our onion crop, we actually use a, a commercial, it's a compost-based mm -hmm. mix mm -hmm. out of Wisconsin called Cowsmo. Mm -hmm. And they have a couple different that. kinds, and our, we use the red one. Okay. And it's okay. an organically certified mix that's a compost-based mix. Okay. And that, that works really well, but again, it is, a, it is a base, and it's a starting point for us. We do, we do add a, a, a nutrient mix. A if they right. need a little extra nitrogen, we'll, we'll uh, irrigate with some fish emulsion. Fish emulsion or a compost tea or All something right. like that, mm -hmm. yeah. Great, great information. Great. We're going to get to just a couple quick questions here. Um, Janice and Deleuze says, I love my lilacs, but they're not long lasting. What would be a good companion shrub to plant with them for longer bloom? Oh, so she wants something that's going to follow up. Yeah. Huh? What do you mm -hmm. think? Yeah. You want to think about that for a minute? Yeah, you, you will think about <laughs> <laughs> there would the, There would be a number. Yeah, so this, this, this is my wife's department. She, okay. But I know out in front of our place, we've got lilacs, we've got uh, nanking cherries, uh -huh. we've got some elderberry mm -hmm. and some choke cherry, and those all come on at different times. And I don't remember if they're before or after, because that, again, it's not my department, but <laughs> you know, those are some good options for sure. having a little bit more succession in, in your perennials that are blooming. Um, here's a question I want to I want to squeeze in because it's about the arborvitae, and uh, Marty from Duluth is concerned it's buried by snow, knocked off the roof. Um, will it survive? Shouldn't be a problem unless there's structural damage. You know, anything coming okay. off the roof. And as people, they probably are going to be removing snow from the roof. You have to be conscious of if everything's protected by snow, you're okay. But yep. you do have to be conscious just of breaking things. So be careful pulling it off the roof. Okay. But the arborvitae itself, I don't think there's going to be any winter browning or winter damage because of the protection we've had there. All right. Uh, which is the best clematis to grow? Ray from <laughs> Ely. Boy, that's a oh. challenging one. There are so there's many. There's so many, aren't there? Yeah, there's yeah, so many. And I, you know, I would start with Jack Manii, which has been around. Mm -hmm. It's the deep purple one. It's been around forever. And uh, the real critical thing, a little different kind of crop because you need good sun, but you need cool roots. So typically maybe an eastern exposure and maybe mulching the roots because it has to be that combination of cool 
soils for the roots and then good adequate uh, sun for the upper portion of the plant. But okay. uh, Jack Manii has been around for a long, long time and it's a good starting point. And then there are literally hundreds of additional yeah. varieties that could be They're grown. lovely though. Well, gosh, I can't believe we're, we already have to say goodbye to you, John Aki. Uh, thank you for being with us and, and all the great information that you provided. We hope you can come back during the season and help Sounds us good. out again. But now we want to take people back to that garden in Hayward for a look at some of the unique and wonderful rhododendrons that were nurtured there, along with some surprising desert plants. The native rhododendron, native to the eastern United States and the Appalachian Mountains, this is the Catawba rhododendron. And likely this grew here in northern Wisconsin before the Ice Age. It uh, thrives under our conditions here. Most of these are hybrids that were developed in Finland. This is Michelli, it's from Finland. It's a cross between the North Korean rhododendron and uh, a species from the Caucasus, from Turkey. As you can see, the flowers are showy enough, but the, look at the new growth. The growth on this is truly amazing. That's growing faster than any of my other rhododendrons. And I think it's just that hybrid vigor. On this side are my test plantings of uh, rhododendrons and other kinds of mostly evergreen plants. There's some magnolias in there too. And there's hundreds and hundreds of uh, seedlings. Some are species like, uh, like these here. These are the, the uh, Rose Bay rhododendron, rhododendron maximum, that's native uh, on the East Coast up to Canada. And then others like this one are hybrids with uh, the hardy North Korean rhododendron. What I'm aiming for in my selection process are large leaves. I want bright colors. I want bright oranges, bright yellows, bright reds. Those are the, the colors that I'm looking for. It's just my personal preference. I am on the American Rhododendron Society seed exchange. So that's how I get m most of my seeds. And uh, that's one of the pleasures of growing plants is being able to share them with other people, share the information, but also the plants. This is uh, the lizard tree from Japan. Uh, Thujopsis, and uh, the reason it's called a lizard tree is because it, even though it looks sort of like our native cedar, it, uh, it has really distinct scales like those on a lizard. Just a fun uh, understory tree. This is a cypress. It's a Cupressus pisifera from Japan. What I really enjoyed about it was that the, the chartreuse color of the foliage. It just as gorgeous, and it keeps this color year round. This is a Himalayan maidenhair. It's an evergreen fern, grows up to 12,000 feet in the Himalayan mountains. So there's plants here from, from all over the world. Site plants to where they want to grow, where, where they're best adapted to. And that's why research about where plants grow in nature is so important. Lots of moss growing on the ground, a foam flower blooming here. And then, as we get farther away from the house, the intensity of light increases. So then we get, the conditions slowly get uh, drier, and so we get plants like Siberian iris, uh, taller boxwoods, uh, Daphne, like this, that are more typically uh, Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean, I might say, type of plants. Uh, there's some tarragon there too, so it gets quite a bit drier. And then when we go all the way over this far away, it gets really, really hot and dry. And so we go from ferns all the way to cacti. Uh, prickly pears, uh, again, depending on, on the species and the, and, the, and the provenance where they come from, do extremely well here in our sandy soil. They're more adaptable than people think. I think the biggest issue with prickly pears is to keep it the, be the bed where you're growing them small. The other thing that cacti in general don't like is debris, leaves in the fall. They, that, will, that will cause them to rot. That's a ball cactus, uh, Escobaria vivipara, and that's the only ball cactus native in Minnesota. This uh, seedling, and you can see several of them in the rock wall, they're, uh, they're actually seedlings from Min the Minnesota form. Welcome back, I'm Pamela Fish here with resident expert Bob Owen and another local grower who has been in the business of gardening for quite some time and is a specialist at growing beautiful things. Welcome, Deb Burns Erickson of Burns Greenhouse in Zim and uh, you guys have been at it up there in Zim for quite some time. We have, yes. My grandfather homesteaded in 1960 uh -huh. and then my father came back and he in 1977 and then we bought the farm in 2008. 
Sure. So. Okay. And just a great farm family. One of our farm <laughs> families of the year, Here which we we're very, very proud of. Yeah. And every generation has got, I don't know if there's any Finn there, but there's a lot of Sisu there. Yeah, 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 there is, there is, Because yeah. there's a lot of determination <laughs> in that is, family, because yeah, it's yeah. not easy making a living on the gr on land in Zim, Minnesota. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, a lot of expertise here at the table, but first I want to talk about um, starting plants early indoors. I know you guys have done that a lot. Um, it's a given for a lot of growers in these parts, but at a greenhouse in Duluth's Denfield neighborhood, they've been growing in sub-zero temperatures. This is our deep winter greenhouse. This has been a long, long project to get up and running. Um, we've worked with a lot of other people, so it's a huge collaboration of a lot of different organizations to get this going. This is our first year growing in it, so it's been kind of an experiment. I take care of growing the plants and selling them at the market and also trying to get restaurants on board with buying local produce. Basically, I you know, do a lot of watering, planting, strategizing, what can I grow, how, um, what way would be the most like food safe and sanitary, keeping the plants happy. We've got a brassica sprouting mixture, which is kind of um, a mix of like kale and kohlrabi and uh, non-heading broccoli, different uh, hardy brassicas that you know people can eat as greens. And we've got flash collards, you know collards for collard greens. So you can see these are, are spaced out a little bit more because this is one of the one of the things I'm going to harvest when it's a little bit more mature. And this is regular arugula, so that's a, a nice spicy, flavorful green. The wasabi arugula, it's a kind of more rare cultivar that you can tell it's a little bit trickier to grow. It's growing a lot slower than the normal arugula. Arugula that's so spicy it tastes like wasabi. Here we've got more of the five star lettuce blend. Um, I want to do a lot of that because people, people like their lettuce. Here we've got mizuna, that's another brassica, so in the kale cabbage family. So it's a real hearty, another salad green. This is our, our first crop of, of greens. We, we had no idea um, what would even grow in this greenhouse at this time of year. And according to our original growing plan, stuff like this mizuna, the, these hardy Asian greens, that should be the only thing we're growing right now for, for January. It's impressive how, how this design has worked for us. And we, we haven't been really using lights. So it's all sun power, which is pretty remarkable. Our winter's market is running right now, and we are the first and third Thursday of every month, and we're at the Duluth Book School. So they started the Lincoln Park Farmer's Market to kind of work with that food access problem. And a great thing that we do there is we do accept EBT. So people can come in with their EBT cards, and we will match them up to $15. I feel like everyone, no matter what class or, or race you are, you should be able to have access to local organic food at a fair price. All right, time for some questions from viewers, and we have one about starting seeds indoors. This is from John in Duluth, who says, without grow lights, can I start my seeds indoors? There has been so little sunlight. Will I be successful at that? Well, the great thing, starting is the Absolutely. problem. Absolutely, <laughs> they'll germinate. There'll be no problem germinating. Mm -hmm. It's going to be growing mild, so mm -hmm. maybe what they could do, and you can jump in mm -hmm. on this if you'd like, Deb, I would delay my planting. So if you're looking at tomatoes as an example, let's, let's start on April 21st because they're going to get long and leggy. Let's find mm -hmm. ourselves a good, sunny, southern window. And then be prepared, get them on a, a wheel cart or something, so when we've got temperatures above freezing during the day, it's sheltered location, you could move them outside, because light is going to be limiting factor. He wants mm -hmm. to do without light. Yeah. He doesn't have a greenhouse. So you're going to have to manage it a little bit, and you want to manage it over a shorter period of time. So could it be done? Absolutely. can be done, but it's going to take a little bit of... Full-time job. Full -time it's a full-time job. job. <laughs> That's what I do, and it's a full-time job, yeah. getting them up to size and getting them healthy and I mean, sure? and you, viable. Are you telling me that maybe just buying a six-pack well, of tomatoes Well, it could be, <laughs> but it is. It, it, it's, yeah, it, it, yes, I think people yes. go in thinking it's not going to be work. Right, it's, it is yes. work. It's yes. work. It definitely is. Or he's okay. got to go to a greenhouse structure, or right. he has to go to artificial lighting and pay the light right. bill and other right. things. Yeah. Right, like a yeah, sure. structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, so give it a try if, <laughs> yeah, if you absolutely. want We're to. all about giving it a try. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Um, ben and Proctor is wondering, is Carl Forrester grass hardy for our area? Well, it's zone four, so, but, and it needs to be high and dry. So if you're in a lower, colder 
area, I we it doesn't do well for us in Zoom. <laughs> but, we're, okay. uh, that, but here, you know, we can go have some, pockets for sure. We can go some I've Carol seen Forrester. It, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. But again, zone four, mm -hmm. and uh, a good site is going to have good drainage, both air and water. Absolutely. So you can't be down in a little pocket where everything sits. It's got to mm -hmm. be up on a slope mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with good yeah. exposure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Shar from Gilbert has tall cedar trees that have turned brown this winter. <laughs> what can I do about it? Mm. <laughs> right after we said there wasn't going to be a lot of winter you said damage. That. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, we always get some winter browning on cedar. Sure. And typically, but it's not the kind of devastating thing where it kills the tree. So, uh, you know, they can be pruned up at any time. Let them grow out and see what the potential damage is. But a little bit of pruning, they can be sheared at any given time. And more than likely, she's not going to have the kind of devastating loss. Right. We always get some needle loss on our arbor vitae mm -hmm. every year. Okay, Jenny from Lake County wants to know, will daylilies on the west side of my house with afternoon sun bloom well and will they have enough hours of daylight? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely, so. on the west yeah. side. Okay. You'll get at least six hours. I mean, that's full sun. Anything, if you have six hours minimum, that's full sun. So. Okay. And they are good in winter, Heidi. Oh, absolutely. The deer like them too. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, a recent check with area greenhouse proprietors, including Deb, left us with a list of gorgeous annuals to try out this season. Here are just a few. Bright, bold colors are trending with flowers like the Big Kiss Gazania in shades of red and orange. Sometimes called African daisies, they work well in containers and even as ground cover and can really take the heat. The Tattoo Series Vinca grows upright in mounds with full blooming petals that look to be inked or airbrushed. These two can take the hottest days of summer, but are said to show their deepest shades where the temps are more mild. The always hardy geraniums have some new colors to choose from in the Calliope series. Look for large calliopes for the boldest statement in garden containers. An old garden favorite, the snapdragon, still gains favor for its resilience and flowering power all season long. And you can find the snapdragon in just about any color of the rainbow. Want green blooms to go with that foliage? Try the green ball dianthus. It sports a perfectly round, green-headed flower with a unique texture and is a fun addition to beds, pots, and for cut flower bouquets. There are new begonias to try. The Funky series comes in bright pink and orange. This shade lover has a more sprawling form and pointy petals. The Bee Dance Bidens will bring in the bees and other pollinators to its vibrant blooms. And for a great filler of standout foliage, the award-winning Lemon Coral Sedum. It may look spiky, but is soft to the touch and grows vigorously in stacks and layers of lime green to chartreuse. Um, one, one thing to follow up on, Lemon Coral Sedum is a proven winner's perennial of the year. Okay, and so they'll be focusing. They'll see that everywhere in all the sure. trade magazines. Okay, with proven winners. So we know it's growing good. <laughs> should, be, should be hardy here. Yeah, today, it's a, it's a zone four, yeah. and it, as long as it has good snow cover, it comes back. And see, okay. we talk about this continuous bloom and mm -hmm. and the color coming into the fall, or they're durable well and, into the fall. Right, and mixing them with your succulents. Succulents. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they just but don't let them take over. Don't be afraid to pull them out of there because mm -hmm. they will take over the right. seedums. Well, pretty aggressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and if you only grow one vegetable, folks from the Duluth Community Garden Program say try the rutabaga because uh, they chose that for the vegetable of the year. Um, I don't know, what do you guys think? You've grown them, I right? I was going to say try the rutabaga. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of an underappreciated. It's delicious. Uh, oh, I love rutabaga and, raw uh, or cooked raw and pasty. Mixed with yeah. Raw, really? Raw, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, try it. And like it was it. a mainstay <laughs> for all the folks that somehow survived in the land before we had all of the, you know, modern We grew it for years, yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. All right, more questions coming in. Um, Jim from Proctor is wondering, do impatients still have problems with powdery mildew? It's downy mildew. Okay. It comes from under the leaf, and it's a spore. It gets in the soil. If you have it, do not plant in that area again with an impatient. They're just not resistant enough to it yet. Um, the sun patients and the New Guinea patients are more resilient to it, but you cannot plant it in the same area. They haven't come up with anything. Unless you, I don't spray anything and I don't use any chemicals, so um, I just wouldn't treat the area, but mm -hmm. you probably could do a, 
some fungicide there. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't, if you've had the problem, all of a sudden your impatience look great and then they drop all their leaves and right. they're done, then that is downy mildew. Okay. And okay. I think I agree. If, it, you know, even if you elected to use something that was labeled, you'd probably have to have a licensed applicant. You'd probably have to be a fumigant. It's really a aggressive. challenging, it aggressive is. disease. Mm -hmm. It planted is. Planted someplace else if you had a Absolutely. problem. Or right. switch species. Right, um, right. Peggy from Lakeside wants to know, why can't I grow snowdrops? They don't come back the following year. Oh, well, I, again, I... Being a bulb like that, I, I rather suspect uh, a drainage issue would be my first, yeah. wet. My first thought. Wet Too wet, wet, maybe heavy clay. Mm -hmm. Let's get it up. Let's mix in some organic material. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Can everybody grow Russian sage in Duluth? It's a zone four. Yeah. Uh -huh. And again, it wants to be dry. Mm -hmm. I, 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 and people need to be patient. A lot sure. of people will just, they don't, <laughs> it's not the first thing to butt out, and it's not. And so you've got to give it some time, maybe crack you know, a branch, see if you see some green in there mm -hmm. before you just yank things out and give up. Don't give up. I mean, we just have to give people the right plant for the right place right. so that they are successful. And even though it may grow, our expression, over the hill, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm beginning to relate more and more to that to expression. That. <laughs> <laughs> but none, nonetheless, uh, over the hill, it will grow, but mm -hmm. You'll ask yourself, because it looks so poor, mm -hmm. do I really want to grow this? Mm -hmm. So you really mm -hmm. do need a good site, and as you said, sown for. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, more of the beautiful perennials and shrubs trending this season include two roses that were developed in northern Wisconsin and in Minnesota. The first, here it is, it's the Cherry Frost, birthed by longtime rose breeder Julie Overham. It's a gorgeous, hardy red shrub rose. Um, the other one that was developed by Dr. David Slezak is the Above and Beyond, and that's an apricot climbing rose. We will see a picture of that right there. Okay, so there it is. Um, and those are, those are two that um, are, are brand new, but expecting great things from them. And in fact, we have one of the uh, Cherry Frost, just Deb right brought it in. And uh, it's just, it looks really healthy in, in um, Looks like it's it's sure to bloom beautifully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last yeah. year was the first year it was in yeah. very short supply, but very I think short, I know yeah. of a greenhouse where they're going to have a pretty <laughs> good I supply. I think so. <laughs> I think so, and I think that that greenhouse they're going to have Julie give a presentation on nice. the rose then really? in the last oh, weekend fun. in April. Great. Yeah. Just guessing. Guessing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that should be a lot of fun, mm -hmm. and um, again, a beautiful, beautiful rose there. Um, other perennials you might want to try. Uh, stainless steel hookara. That one is pretty cool. The brass lantern hookarella. Um, there are some flowering shrubs like the berry white hydrangea. Um, and then the bright lime colored lemony lace elderberry. Finally, we're hearing, and don't laugh, we're hearing that moss is trending in a lot of gardens. Boy. And I know that makes you guys giggle because... Um, Good news for us, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All along we knew this was the best plant to be growing in damp, wet places. The That's best it. The world Shade, right. right. If you don't have grass, you have moss. Yeah. People apparently are loving their moss. So. Awesome. You know, I, it is. I like mine. As long as people are happy and they're growing. Yeah, that's great. Right. Right. You know, we joke That's about right. it, but it has become real big on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And in areas where you, you just say shade, you don't want to take the trees down, you have too much moisture, and this may be the real case this year, and with our climate change, mm -hmm. you might just accept the fact that moss is the best thing you could grow and just just celebrate it. Right. Or, and then you could do your impatience in containers. Absolutely. And, you know, and either, you know, put them in the ground so that they're easier to manage or, you know, if you just place that pop of color, you right. know, it's amazing. Your eye will just go to that. You won't see sure. your growing moss or that you right. <laughs> only have moss. You'll and see. retire the lawnmower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, well here now is um, a look at some of what's coming up during our regular season of Great Gardening. A farm just outside of Duluth is producing food for university students while teaching them about everything from biology to agriculture and the value of sustainable practices. Some consider gardening an art, while a group of master gardeners from Washburn, Wisconsin have taken it a step further and created a museum exhibit of beautiful artwork inspired by their love of gardening. Homegrown mushrooms are on the menu at a local farm where they say with the right materials and environment, shrooms can be easily produced. We tour several gardens from across the region, many designed to attract pollinators and will have suggestions for pollinator plants for you to try. That and much more on our 17th season of Great Gardening. 
Probably. And we'll be back mm -hmm. with our what? What was that? That one? <laughs> the Dan Tura, Angel Trumpet. Angel we, Trumpet, mm -hmm. beautiful, isn't it? We yeah, we it. went uh, on a tour where they had some gorgeous ones, and we'll be seeing those coming up this season. Our regular season uh, thirty-minute shows start on April fourth. Okay, we have time for just a couple more questions. Just going to say we had the question about edible flowers. That one is not. <laughs> That's no, oh, that correct. One's That's poisonous, poisonous <laughs> right? and yes. hallucinogenic. Okay. Oh, it's gorgeous. You know it is. Well, I don't know that. But <laughs> <laughs> You've heard. I, I have heard okay. that. Okay. Bob. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, Bonnie from Finland says, "Is a compost pile too hot to grow tomatoes or other heat-loving plants in directly?" Yes, it can be. If it's being managed properly, you've got 120, 130, 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. Compost files are for making compost, not tomatoes. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Agree? Yeah, absolutely. Take, take the compost out when exactly. it's mature. Exactly, once it's done, and then it use it. the soil or work mm -hmm. it into your mm -hmm. potting soil mix, and it's valuable, but not mm -hmm. in the not Speaking in the of hot soil. dirt, is there a mm -hmm. simple way to sanitize soils to be used in growing flowers? And you do that at your place. Absolutely. So we bake all of our soil so that we don't, it's soil, it's real soil. It's good soil that it's organic. is organic, soil. and so instead of you know, you know, people buy it, and you, it's, not, it's soilless mixes. So if you add, even if you cook some of your own soil, that's a good garden light soil. garden soil mm -hmm. that you prize and you've developed, and you can bake that at 170. We bake ours to 170, and then it's free of pathogens and weed seed, and you you can top, top dress a lot of your containers so you won't have weeds. You'll have that mm -hmm. organic flush that goes into the roots when they get big enough and they need it. Then they get a real, you know, they get a nice boost of nitrogen and, you know, micro yeah. nutrients and everything else mm -hmm. that they need. She made okay, several one real good, real good points. Not too hot. 170 degrees isn't yep. too hot. That about right. 45 okay. minutes. Yep. Put it in a cake pan, mm -hmm. and I guarantee you, you'll drive everybody out of the kitchen. Well, <laughs> some people like that. All right, so one more, no, one more question yeah. just to squeeze in. It's from Karen, who overwintered her geraniums. They're all leggy. What can I do with those? So there's a few options, right? Uh -huh. So you could, like, you could, if they're long and leggy, you could cut them back, but you've got to leave some leaves on them so they can do photosynthesis. Otherwise, they'll just mm -hmm. die. But, or you can do a soft pinch to the top, and all of the inner nodes will break, and it will just flush. Okay. And so then you could take cuttings off of that. You could do that. Or you could just let it fill in um, and just get it acclimated to the sun. I mean, generally, they're just... You keep them dark and they just get rangy and sure. if you can just get them into the sun. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty hardy, honestly. Yeah. We barely keep our geraniums that we winter above freezing. Okay. You know, and so you can get up. them outside. Um, and you really want to get them that cutting done right now. Yeah, absolutely. Because you want them to bloom. Yes. So the best thing to do is buy a few new ones from another greenhouse window. Absolutely. That's a great <laughs> idea. That's okay, Bob, we want to... Bloom and then later. Right, right. We want to take a second to talk about the spring garden extravaganza that's yeah. coming up, and that is April 13th at uh, the cop what used to be the Copper Top Church. And what are you guys going to talk about? You know, our theme really is about... Um, Gardening for a Healthier Life and Environment. We're going to take a look at a lot of climate change. Dr. Mark Seeley, the state climatologist, will join us, and we're going to actually show gardeners what they can do to help the climate change Excellent. issue and actually improve by it. And then we're going to look at all the issues, from eating better to better mental health. And where can we find out more about that? It will be on St. Louis County website. There it is. Okay. And we'll be talking more about that in the future. And it, you can look for more information on our website, wdsc.org slash gardening. And um, gosh, a big thank you to you, Deb Burns. Uh, nice to have you here for the first time sharing your time and talents today. We hope to see you back during the regular season. And thanks. Of course, to you, Bob Olin, you're always great, and we really appreciate your coming back. And we want to say thank you to our phone volunteers from St. Louis County Master Gardeners. Now, there's more time to get calls in to pledge your support for this program and all your favorite PBS shows. But thanks for watching. We hope to see you back here in April.